Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Luminate webinar on a possible recession. And the question mark in the title obviously is appropriate because uh, the future, short, medium and long term, is still shrouded in uncertainty. And uh, actually thinking about that, that old uh, motif about the only constant is change, etc. I think it's fair to say right now, reworking that a little bit, the only certainty is uncertainty. Now, according to some headlines, going back several months actually, the UK did enter recession. Uh, other headlines say it's only a matter of time before we do, and others are preserving a measure of optimism about a possible recession's severity. And of course, in this week particularly it feels, political turmoil, it only adds to the sense of trepidation and, and potential chaos, doesn't it? Um, so it's all a very cloudy, um, fragmented picture at the moment with, with so much going on and in so many different areas, social, political and economic. Uh, but for the purposes of our discussion today, in, in terms of a definition, a recession is a period of general economic decline marked by a falling GDP in two successive quarters. But the different characteristics of recessions will be the subject of our discussion. Now, we're going to try and avoid dealing with speculation because there's no shortage of that right now. And much of it, frankly, is unhelpful. We will share what we know and what we've learned from previous crises and experience. And I'm conscious that events are so fast moving at the moment that all of this that we're talking about today could be swept away and rendered redundant by tomorrow morning. Um, however, in the meantime, we're going to look at the general situation in the job market um, and just try to sort of glean some, I suppose, some sort of signals and signs um, to help navigate our way. Well, the overall picture in the job market generally is one of fewer vacancies and more unemployment than previously. But... Um, a labour force that's also falling at the same rate as vacancies and they're sort of out of line. So there are still more opportunities, more vacancies and job opportunities uh, than there are unemployed people. And long-standing recruitment difficulties uh, that we've all been aware of for, for, for many, many years in some cases do not look likely to be significantly eased at present and nor do they look likely to be significantly eased if we go into a period of downturn. And this is particularly the case in construction, uh, production and manufacturing, healthcare, logistics, hospitality. And much of this is actually long term and really sort of quasi systemic. I mean, for example, a shortage of nurses feels like that that's sort of something that's just baked into the structure of the labour market um, and has been for, for, for many, many years. In terms of uh, the number of vacancies, uh, well, June to August 2020, uh, the total number of job vacancies in the UK was 1.266 million, which was a de decrease of 34,000 from the previous quarter. Although there are still more vacancies, as we say, in the UK than unemployed people. In the period from June to August 2022, vacancies were just over 59% above the January to March 2020 pre-coronavirus, or shall we say pre-C level, um, which is the, the, the benchmark, that I suppose, that we, or the baseline that, that, we, that we use at the moment, given the, the unprecedented period that followed that. And uh, a little over 20% above the same time last year. Now, the effect of, of coronavirus on job numbers has, of course, varied across the labour market. Uh, 10 of the 20 industry sectors monitored by the uh, Office for National Statistics, the ONS, are still below pre-coronavirus levels. And the hardest hit sector is wholesale and retail trade. That saw the largest falling job numbers, more than 200,000. Most of the jobs in this sector are below graduate level. And there have been large increases in other industries, uh, notably uh, administration, support, professional, scientific and technical activities, education, um, information and communication. Well, they're at record levels. And the majority of these jobs, um, or the majority of jobs that these sectors and categories rather cover, are in fact graduate level, which actually speaks to the importance of graduates to the strength of professional level employment. And uh, incidentally, it rebuts one of the perennial myths. It's one of many actually, and that's a subject of a, a separate session on uh, busting 
myths about the graduate labour market. But this is a very strong one. This idea that there aren't enough good jobs for graduates. It's a sort of uh, companion for the, the, the trope about there's no need to go to university or there's no value in having a degree. So this idea um, that there's, there's just far too many highly qualified graduates for jobs available. Well, actually, if anything, the reverse is true. The demand for professional level work generally outstrips the supply of graduates during good economic times and bad, actually. And in the most recent graduate outcomes survey, it was more than 70% of graduates in employment, this is 15 months uh, after they left university, more than 70% were in professional level work. Um, and of the, the remaining um, the balance of that, many of them were on their way towards it or, or you know, deferring entry into professional graduate type work. Um, so professional level work, graduate type employment, graduate jobs, always hold up well this is a, a, a theme that runs through through this subject and, and many others graduate employment holds up well even in times of economic downturn it did in the last major recession um, and in earlier recessions too and it did in 2020 as well albeit there was a, a, a large systemic shock for a relatively short period if we um have a look at some of the uh data and stats and uh, we won't over over dwell on this this is just to, to paint a, a top level picture but this is uh data that's um, based on research from uh british chambers of commerce the recruitment and employment confederation rec and the ons again amongst others um all indicators uh, drawn from this research and data um suggest that business conditions and confidence have fallen actually significantly from their quarter two positions. So sort of top level view of this, for example, uh, more businesses are now seeing their cash flow decreasing. The percentage of firms expecting to see their turnover increase over the next 12 months, as an example, is down 10 percentage points on where it was in quarter two. And uh, more businesses expect profits to decrease than increase. That's a pretty, pretty pessimistic picture in terms of the, um, I suppose, the disposition and, and the morale uh, of business to some extent. But hiring activity was up in September, but the rate of increase has slowed substantially, both for temporary and permanent vacancies. So there's that sense of a, a slight slowing down and more rapid in some areas in uh, confidence and, and to some extent activity. Salaries are continuing to rise, um, partly as a, a consequence of rising cost of living um, and competition for scarce workers in particular, because uh, again, a, a theme running through this and, and generally at the moment is this issue around shortages and scarcity. Um, so an aspect of that, candidate numbers uh, continue to fall sharply overall. Permanent staff availability, deteriorated at a quicker pace in, in, in the recent quarter than that's seen for temporary workers. And I think a, a very important factor that weighs on the question of candidate numbers um, is a greater hesitancy amongst people to apply for new roles. And that's obviously driven by some apprehension about the economic outlook. And that's what we would expect in such conditions that caution and hesitancy um, and a weighing up of the risks of moving on uh, in, in conditions of some uncertainty. Um, in the most recent week uh, for which we have data, um, the number of UK online jobs uh, was broadly unchanged actually, but it's 17% lower than the equivalent of week of 2021. That's according to ONS, um, Adzuna reporting um, a slightly more positive situation. But if we think back of the conditions in the labour market, let's say a year ago, the, the sort of the bounce back uh, and the recalibrating that came, you know, uh, as a result of the lockdown crisis and the opening up and the loosening of restrictions. Um, and there was so much more economic activity going on that we, there was very much like a, a bounce effect uh, that was being felt. Um, arguably not a typical experience, but there's um, certainly reasonable stability in the number of online jobs. And, and half of the online job categories um, were actually seeing an increase. And the largest of these, and obviously for our purposes, the most significant was in the graduate category, which actually rose by 13%. And that's the same level as it was a year ago. So doing better than the labour market generally and evidence perhaps of the graduate labour market holding its nerves so far. 
So that's some of the, say, the signals and signs and auguries and omens uh, based upon sort of data and, and, and research that's, that's, that's contemporaneous. Um, adding to the idea and supporting certainly the idea that there definitely looks like a downturn coming, possibly a recession. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, some commentators believe that it is already here. But we've been looking at sort of labour market indicators, um, which are obviously a, a vital signs in these matters. But I think it's also to con important to consider the things that give colour to what you might call the wider public perception um, of economic conditions. And they are things like inflation, cost of living factors and around food and energy or shortages and the aforementioned political upheaval, they all contribute to a picture of, of, uh, of the sort of relative health of society and the economy. And of course, the job market, whether that be the subset of the graduate job market, early careers or the job market generally, does not exist in isolation from society because being an economic driver, it's part of the bedrock of society, what's, what makes society happen and, and exist. And how the next few months pan out will be determined by the interplay of all these forces uh, and not least as well the way in which people talk about it and the coverage that these questions get and the research and analysis that's done but in thinking about recessions as a particular sort of phenomenon well they're all interpreted inevitably with reference to their predecessors and you'll be hearing a lot at the moment and certainly much more uh, as we go through the next few months about what happened during the lockdown turn or the 2008 global financial crash because they are the most recent examples of widespread and, and sort of systemic um, sort of distress in the economy. There's much less talk nowadays about the recession of the early 90s. Uh, certainly not much about the situation in, in the early to mid 1980s, um, really, because they are actually so far distant in time now. Well, not to everybody, I guess, but uh, they certainly seem to be receding into uh, the rearview mirror uh, quite rapidly. But it's important that we sort of take them into account because they serve to remind us that economic volatility is cyclical and it repeats. And none of us on this call or in the workplace now and, and the generations to come will not experience a period of economic downturn in our working lives and many of us will experience a number of them of, of different degree and severity and actually just looking back down the historical timeline with some of the current indicators um, of conditions at the moment such as high prices for example uh, shortages of commodities the next recession might have more in common with the early 90s than 2008. Uh, but that is actually getting into the realms of speculation. We did promise to, to stay away from that. So we'll just finish on this point by saying, like all downturns, there will be unique features about what, what may be coming. Uh, and actually, this one may mark a dubious first. This is really significant. We have not gone into a downturn with a labour shortage before. So that really is uncharted territory. A few of the um, characteristics of, of, of what we, we might expect based upon previous experience. Well, traditionally in a recession, we would expect to see a fall off in recruitment that would hit new entrants to the jobs market the hardest um, and also perhaps precipitate an exodus of older workers. Um, so in this model, um, what typically happens is uh, recruitment schemes, work experience, training programs, etc., are cut back or delayed, um, postponed, etc. And graduate unemployment uh, would go up, though very important to say, not to the levels of non-graduate unemployment, um, along with uh, amazing growth in the volume of media articles um, dealing with the, the situation generally and particularly questioning the value of higher education, uh, one of those myths of the graduate labour market I touched on a moment ago. And thinking back actually uh, back to the uh, sort of 2008 onward period, <clears throat> it's hard to forget some of the lurid headlines during that time, uh, particularly about, for example, a lost generation of graduates that were doomed to a lifetime of low paid and insecure work. Um, that was not an untypical uh, newspaper headline or, or way of dealing with the crisis at the time. And of course, the reality was very different because, yes, there were 
there was an effect on the health of the graduate labour market. But graduates came through it and the graduate job market came through it and graduate recruiters came through it. And there were changes and differences and shifts in emphases. But graduates did much better in that recession than their non-graduate counterparts, as they always do. But the effect of that sort of coverage uh, can actually be uh, pernicious. I remember one of our career service colleagues reporting, and it's been around 2010, that whilst many of their students had developed a fatalistic attitude about the prospects, they, that, they believed that there were no graduate jobs, that there was no point in thinking about getting a graduate job, that there was no point in applying for a graduate job because the opportunities just weren't there. Even whilst the students had that demoralised perspective, they were saying they were being inundated with calls from recruiters, really, really keen to get in front of those students at that, at that challenging time. And in fact, on that time, that occasion, many of those recruiters were SMEs because they understood that there might be opportunities with a large cohort not necessarily going through into full graduate employment right at that time to actually go into that market um, and, and sort of, you know, get access to that talent themselves. So it shows the sort of the risks that come with a uh, saturation of negative media coverage, um, although obviously uh, realism is, is critically important as well. But Again, we see the idea of a typical recession, whatever that might be. Uh, the jobs market generally starts to fall off once it becomes plain and clear that the conditions are going to be hard and conditions are going to be difficult. It will continue to slide for several quarters and then start to get back on its feet. Um, but that can be a, a lengthy process. And some graduates, of course, in any period of downturn, will be hit worse than others. And interestingly, it's not always the ones from the subjects, for example, the disciplines that you might expect, for example, arts or humanities graduates, but often it's those graduates in fields that are most exposed to, say, large reductions in spending on big capital projects, say, in engineering and construction. Um, that's where you can get quite sudden shifts um, in the sort of in, the, in recruitment patterns and volumes. But those sorts of, um, sort of areas of activity, those sorts of sectors are often the first to see an upturn in recruitment when confidence surges back into the system and projects get back on their feet again. And I should also mention that another what you might call typical characteristic of a downturn in the early careers market, and it's certainly one that we've seen in the, the last two instances, is a spike in the entry to further study, postgraduate study. Um, the motivation being in this case, uh, in addition to all the normal um, you know, career positive constructive reasons for doing PG study, et cetera, but it can also be to sort of tie up away from the turbulence of the job market, do a period of study, and emerge better qualified when conditions improve. And that model has held true in every occasion that we've got the data for to date. But this time round, it could be interesting to observe the dynamics. Will the cost of ling factor deter people from going into further study in larger numbers than usual? Will it actually be a driver to get work, work of any kind, uh, let alone uh, better paid professional work? So uh, that we may well be a different dynamic at work this time round. We move on to um, 10 observations. Could have been 20, could have been 100, but we've limited it to 10. And um, we're very careful not to build this section as uh, predictions because we decommissioned our crystal ball in March 2020. It was clearly of no value whatsoever. It was it had been absolutely useless in its prognostications and we're not bringing it back anytime soon. But we will just look at what we know at the moment, what people are talking about, what, what we think, and I suppose really what are the key areas uh, that we need to be uh, focusing on. But point number one, um, talked about about media coverage and and um, an opinion around around the coming crisis um you read a lot of articles predicting what employment's going to be like over the next few months what economic conditions are going to be like what the job market is going to be like now the reality is many of them i don't want to say they're going to be totally wrong but they are kind of estimating at the moment as well and it won't do to to put too much faith in what's being written now about what may be happening in six months quite simply we're entering totally uncharted waters we absolutely have no maps no compasses for this one um just our commonsensical experience of what's happened before uh, at this point about there being a labor shortage going to a session with a labor shortage i mean that is really really different um so you know re that really does scupper the um, sensibleness of, of making predictions so there's very little certainty around that again the only certainty is uncertainty um point number two um on the uncertainty point we just don't know how long 
this, what, whatever this is and whatever it becomes, will last. And to take, for example, uh, the, the global financial crash, well, that began officially in 2008. But the queues at Northern Rock, if you remember, I mean, that was a highly visual starting point of people's consciousness about that crisis and that crash. So those queues outside Northern Rock branches, they took place a year before. And that was what really told the public something serious was happening. But then the economy itself didn't actually hit the seabed until 2011. So there's a long duration and there are lots of sort of moving parts in that. Uh, and they're, they're not necessarily calibrated in a, in a logical way. We may be in this one for, for a while. It could be a long haul, particularly if inflation remains high. Positively, and this is absolutely crucial and critical. I mean, this has been proven time and again. We've got the evidence for this. The UK labour market, not to mention the graduate market, proves itself remarkably adaptable and resilient during crisis. It proved it during the lockdown period. Um, it didn't just outperform the worst case scenarios then, it pretty much outperformed the best cases as well. Uh, and it proved it also um, to a great extent in 2008 onwards. So in the case of UK graduates, for example, despite the worst hiring environment we can remember in June 2020, when activity just drained away, the majority of graduates that year got jobs and good jobs at that. And there's no reason to believe that most graduates will not find work again. Training and recruitment, that's all about investing in the future of business. Obviously, we, we know that instinctively. We know that strategically. We have evidence to show that recessions end and business adapts to new conditions. And when they do, when they do, when we do, all of us, we won't just need new hires. We'll need fresh ideas and fresh faces and fresh thinking and fresh skills from people who've actually experienced tough times. And that's nowadays when they've been at university as well and entering the labour market. And often the experience of that, that, those hard times, that toughness really does bring out the very best in people and develops all sorts of new skills and attributes. And businesses that skimp on graduate recruitment in the bad times generally tend to regret it when things improve. In terms of sort of things around candidate availability and the point about the, the labour market shortages, we just simply don't have enough candidates right now in whole swathes of the labour market. And that's not going to change irrespective of how conditions pan out. Now, we're not going to suddenly find ourselves with lots of nurses, doctors or social workers, engineers, IT professionals just becoming available. The retention for recruiters, it might become a bit easier because workers may well become more risk averse. But with cost of living outrunning pay awards by significant sums, many workers may be likely to look for better salaries elsewhere. So the, the question of retention, recruitment in the first place, skills shortages, frankly, might be exacerbated by what's coming. It certainly won't be improved by it. And this leads on to one of the biggest mistakes that uh, some recruiters made during the lockdown period. Um, assuming that there was going to be a large influx of newly unemployed talent onto the market, some of them held off recruitment in the first half of 2020, even when it became plain that businesses were adapting to lockdown much better than, well, really better than any of us expected, didn't it? I mean, hard as it was um, and, and shocking as it was to start with, it normalised very, very quickly. Um, I think there was an assumption in some quarters that there would be lots of new workers coming onto the market later in the year and hiring would be relatively easy and relatively cheap and of course this never happened so if you need to recruit now don't assume that in a few months it'll be a lot easier to recruit say a coder or a project manager or any other hard to fill role that you're struggling with just because workers have been laid off and they might sort of come running for opportunities it, it's not going to work like that it doesn't work like that and hasn't done before uh, we need to mention hybrid working. Um, I mean, in terms of it being a talking point, it's it's a constant one, isn't it? And it's a constantly evolving aspect of normal workplace life now. Um, I think we should just limit this to saying that there's a, a lot of sometimes quite excitable talk about what the next few months might mean um, for workers at home with rising costs of living. Are they likely to want to come back en masse and en bloc to the workplace? Um, because it's actually going to be cheaper to do that, possibly in some cases, but I think it's unlikely that in most instances, um, commuting is going to be a cheaper option even than staying at home necessarily. Um, and I think we also need to remember that the positive transformational effect of hybrid working on the lives of, of people, certainly about with, with children, or with work-life balance or other commitments, or just the distance factor, well, they're not going to become any less significant or profound. So, 
this is going to be, I think we, we believe, a constant dialogue and a constant iteration and reiteration of, of the normality of it. But hybrid working is expected now, isn't it? It's it's, it's something that, that employees and employers just have accepted as, an, as a normal aspect of work. And that's a transformation that's happened very quickly. Um, but there might be nuances and changes in the way that people value it. It's possible that employers might become more enthusiastic than previously and workers a little less so. But we, again, we need to keep a watching brief on that. But in terms of behaviour, we are going to see some aspects change and for example salary could become more important for, for candidates than it has been in the recent past not that it hasn't been important at all but i think the, the development of importance around things like csi corporate csi well-being uh, csr so corporate csi corporate csr um and uh, diversity etc um they're not going to become any less important but salary is going to become critical around things like cost of living and I think also um, it could be a problem for, for some recruiters if you can't offer the same rates as your competitors. You may lose out in a, in a war for salaries driven by uh, graduate demand and possibly SMEs could find themselves outbid um, for talent or even raided by large arrivals. Um, we mentioned diversity. A recession is not likely to have a meaningful effect, meaningful effect on business attitudes towards increasing diversity. Um, it's going to be as important and critical as it has become recently, and that is never going to change. But the important point to remember in this, downturns always disproportionately affect sections of the population more prone to experiencing disadvantage in the first place. So all of the advantages of a diverse workforce that makes the best use of talent will remain. And some CIPD research recently found that actually that half of workers surveyed said they would consider leaving an employer if it dropped its commitment to EDI. Uh, and finally, following on from point nine, there's one thing we can predict with some certainty, and this is the only prediction that we'll confidently make today, is that bad though things might get for UK graduates, they will be less affected than people without their level of qualification. The only thing worse than being a graduate in a recession is being a non-graduate in a recession. And the shape of the labour market and the way that we work will be different in a couple of years to the way that we work now. And time and again, graduates have shown that they have the resilience and adaptability to take to new and changed circumstances and to help our businesses adapt and thrive. So back graduates to adapt and thrive this time as well. And we shall finish on that point. And we've run right up to the uh, the allotted hour, haven't we? So let's uh, look at a couple of questions, which we will take now. And anything else that hasn't been covered, uh, we'll be delighted to uh, f follow up with um, when we send out the, the transcript, uh, sorry, the recording, we can cover some uh, questions that have been um, put up that we haven't had time to do. Um, just one of them that's come through, let's see. We're hearing a lot about student and graduate wellbeing and confidence. How can employers do more to help support student and graduates in the, tr in the transition into the world of work? Um, yes, well, uh, many ways many ways to to answer that i think going back to our um our surveys and i mentioned that the um importance of mental health and well-being was uh, this is for all students in the survey whether they be uh, college at school right up to final year and graduate um, and that was i think absolutely a consequence of the of the period of being at university during the coronavirus era um, and some of the, the challenges that, that they faced around that. Um, in our advice and, and guidance that we put out to students uh, during that time, um, we talked a lot about, and we weren't the only people to do this obviously, we talked a lot about how to turn those sorts of issues around adversity into qualities, um, how to show that the, the struggle that they might have had to sort of go through, whether it be like learning or job hunting or developing employability. Um, obviously, what, what did they learn from that? What new skills did they have to develop? What imaginative um, and innovative uh, techniques or routes or, um, or, or platforms that they use in order to sort of improve their position, um, understand employability, improve their career development, etc. Uh, and that all became part of the sort of how they presented themselves to employers. And on the employer side, it is about fundamentally 
Uh, I think we, we produced an article about this around the time, I think, um, about cut it, giving cutting graduates a bit of slack and you know, understanding that they will not have had access to or did not have access at that time to the typical amount of work experience um, that they would normally expect to have or their teaching and education was being disrupted uh, the exam process hadn't gone in the way that it would do typically um, and therefore to place less emphasis on those aspects of their sort of overall skill set and focus much more on things around personal attributes and qualities, personal development and skills. And as I mentioned, examples of how they um, had, had sort of shown initiative in the face of adversity. So I think that's one, one aspect of it. Um, and the other, just briefly, tactically, uh, also extends into the in information that gets put out at that critical point of um, engagement. Um, and these, and again, these are not anything necessarily to do with the crisis period, but I think they, they really come into their own during these times. Um, but we're thinking of things like salary. If there are falling engagement and falling applications and graduates are uncertain about their sort of their worth in the labour market or what, what they should be asking for, not putting up front salary information, I think, you know, in general terms, um, isn't helpful. And you have to be as clear as possible with them at that, that, that outset. Another area that is very interesting, and, and we, we see a lot of employers starting to do this, is putting up much more visibly information, for example, actually in a job advert, um, around stuff like how you, the interview process or the application process is managed for people with, say, neurodiversity um, uh, conditions and situations, um, making provision at the outset that answers those questions that sometimes applicants go away and ponder over and then which become blockers to them actually seeing through an application. Um, so that, that's just a, a couple of examples, but I think the general principle is understanding that this present cohort and the previous one and the one to come well it's utterly different isn't it really to anything that we've experienced going back decades frankly this is a very very new type of student and graduate um but finishing on this point about the, the continuity the cohort now the lockdown generation cohort the co cohorts to come they're just as viable and work ready and desirable as candidates um as any generation that preceded them and well, just think of this final critical point, and this is an, going back to a numbers point, 425,000 students, 18-year-old students enrolled at university this year. That's an absolute record. And it's a record number of them are from um, lower socioeconomic backgrounds or more disadvantaged backgrounds in some cases. And they'll be graduating in 2025. So how we start engaging with them now is, is going to be crucial because that represents the biggest talent pool of young qualified workers of the greatest range of diversity in UK history. And what an opportunity that is, as well as a challenge. Um, so I think having that long view that will take us through whatever downturn is coming and see us through the other side, and there's a great prize in the future, apart from anything else, for, for graduate recruiters and for students and graduates and for all of us. So I think keeping that long-term that long, that long -term view is the most important thing we can do, and staying engaged is paramount. So we shall end on that and deal with any other questions separately. I'd like to thank you all very, very much for attending today. And um, we shall be speaking to you soon. And I'll finally plug Luminate, sign up to the newsletter. Everything that we've talked about today is dealt with in a much more deep dive way uh, on Luminate. So we heartily recommend that you take advantage of that. Thank you and goodbye.